Right. Um, so thanks everyone um, for joining us at um, this 15th meeting of the Sensitive Data Community of Practice. Um, so this Community of Practice is co-facilitated by the ARDC, the Australian Data Archive and RNET. And uh, for those of you who are um, maybe new to the community, um, it's a place where we come together from a wide range of um, disciplines and positions who all deal with um, sensitive research data and um, talk about the shared uh, challenges and opportunities um, around working with that data. So um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging and celebrating the first Australians on whose traditional lands we're meeting and um, pay my respects to elders past and present. Um, for me, that's the Wajak Noongar people. Um, and I'd like to do a little bit of housekeeping to start with. Uh, so we have a community document where we'll be uh, taking notes. I'll pop a link to that in the chat in just a moment. Um, because there are so many of us, um, I have hopefully set you all to be on mute as you join and you may not at the moment be able to unmute yourself. It's just so that we can all hear ourselves think. Um, if later on in the, um, when we get to the discussion section, um, I may be able to unmute you, but otherwise, if you have any uh, questions as we run through the presentation, if you could enter them into the chat and then uh, we can address them at the end of the presentation. Um, so uh, today we are very lucky uh, to have uh, Dr. Lisa Streeline with us from the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies. Um, and she'll be taking us through the IATSIS Code of Ethics for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Research. Um, and this is, uh, I think, a really interesting topic for our community because um, working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander data um, has both a lot of shared uh, properties with other types of sensitive data, so issues around uh, governance, security, um, access, that kind of thing, but then also there are some um, more unique elements to do with things like community consent that we need to consider. So um, I'm really excited to have uh, so many of us here to um, hear Lisa presenting this topic. Um, I will let um, Lisa get started. Excellent. Thanks, Nicola. Um, and uh, welcome, everybody. Um, I would also like to extend um, my acknowledgement to the traditional owners of the country in which we're meeting. For us, that's the Ngunnawal country. Um, and to acknowledge um, the, the unceded sovereignty of those peoples around the country um, and to acknowledge the importance of the topic we're talking about today for um, the recognition and protection of the rights of Indigenous people to control their own heritage. Um, and that's pretty much the foundation on which the IATSIS code is founded. Um, we don't have a huge amount of time today, it's just an hour um, together. So this will be a bit of a, uh, a quick um, tour of the code. Um, and we will, we do offer, we will be offering some training around the code that goes a bit more in depth over the next um, 12 months. So uh, there may be an opportunity for you to find out more if um, it has particular relevance to your work um, and you feel like you need uh, more information. Um, today, in terms of the outline of the session, sorry, <laughs> Lauren's trying to keep up with me. <laughs> um, uh, so Lauren's driving the PowerPoint because um, I need to see my notes. So um, apologies for that. Um, so we really just want to provide an introduction to the, the new IATSIS Code of Ethics explore a bit about what we consider to be Indigenous data and therefore covered by the code, um, to give you a bit of an introduction about why you need to know about the code and how to use it, um, and an overview of the principles and how they might apply to Indigenous data. If we've got time and interest, we can also talk a little bit about um, uh, applying for ethics clearance and what um, ethics committees might be looking for in relation to Indigenous data um, when they're applying the code. So firstly, it's probably useful to locate the IATSIS code in our um, Australian Research um, Framework for Ethical and Responsible Conduct of Research. And most of you will be familiar with the first two documents, the primary documents um, in relation to 
um, ethical and responsible conduct. At the top of the tree is the Australian Code for Responsible Conduct of Research. It's a principles-based document um, and it's binding on all researchers in Australia, particularly ap applicable to those in the university sector but um, and the publicly funded research um, sector, um, but is also relevant to any of you who are conducting research um, within government or industry. Um, the code uh, was revised in 2018 and um, has particular reference to responsibilities of researchers in relation to um, engagement with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, and from that, um, from the code base also has some really great guides um, and supporting references. Um, and most of you will be aware that one of those includes the management of data and information in research. Sitting below the code of conduct is the National Statement on Ethical Conduct um, in Human Research. Uh, that applies to research that involves human participants. Um, so any research involving human participants must adhere to the national statement. Um, and involving human participants includes, uh, includes da their data. Um, so it doesn't actually require research to be talking to the humans. Um, it actually applies whenever you are working with um, uh, people's data, um, which is important for us. Um, the IATSIS code really speaks to both of those. It is a code of ethics, but it also touches on some of the issues that are raised in the Code for Responsible Conduct, um, including things like authorship and um, uh, collaboration. So, uh, so the, the Code of Ethics is consistent with both those documents. It speaks to both those documents and basically looks at how you apply um, the, the, the foundations of ethics and responsible conduct in an Indigenous context. The national statement itself has a chapter on uh, Indig Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, that's currently being revised, um, but again, um, you know, the, the code elaborates on how to apply those principles um, appropriately in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander research. Many of you will also be aware that there are specific other guidelines that might apply to your research if you're doing animal research or clinical research, um, genomics, those kind of things. So we won't talk too much about that. Um, but just so that you're aware, there are other um, uh, other codes that may apply to your particular work. There's also ones around evaluation and quality assurance. That Uh, sorry, Lisa, I think we may have lost your sound. There we go. <laughs> Brilliant. Back again? Not sure Back where you again. lost me, but hopefully. <laughs> oh, it's just um, uh, 20 seconds ago. <laughs> okay, so uh, what is Indigenous data? So let's um, start from there. Um, so Indigenous data, uh, um, if you didn't hear me, uh, refers to any information or knowledge, regardless of its format, that is about or may affect Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples collectively or individually. The, in relation to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander research, the idea of collective impact um, is actually really significant, um, uh, as well as you know, what we're used to, which is things um, that are concerned with individuals and individual data, individual consent. When you're talking about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander data, you're, talking, you're looking at also um, a, obtaining, um, uh, a, having a, a responsibility to the collective. So Indigenous peoples as peoples, as groups, um, that may be impacted by the research. Um, so that's a fairly broad definition, but that definition is relatively consistent with um, uh, the, well, it is consistent with the other framework documents. Uh, it's um, the questions about, um, about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Island people, and we'll talk a bit more about what, you know, 
about means um, and also um, might affect uh, when you're looking at um, working with Indigenous data, uh, we're looking at um, the, the risks and implications for Indigenous people. When we talk about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander research involving data, we're also talking about collections and archival collections. Um, so that is more the, in the, the nature of information. Um, so archival research is covered by the code in relation to the use of data. We do follow the principles of Indigenous data sovereignty that have been um, established both here and internationally, and in particular, um, the interpretation of principles, um, for example, the FAIR principles, and looking at the Indigenous uh, aspects of that um, that have been established. Um, for those of you who are not aware, there's the um, Global Indigenous Data Alliance um, principles called the CARE principles that um, you should be aware of, and they're outlined in the code as well. Before we go through the principles, I just um, wanted to talk briefly about why um, all of you need to know about the code. Um, first of all, you want to use the code in order to ensure you're conducting Indigenous data projects ethically and with respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, there are um, there is guidance in the national statement um, and the um, the other guides that are associated with uh, the the key the two key framework documents. But the code of ethics um, goes into much more detail, um, particularly around how you can structure um, engagement and collaboration and particularly Indigenous leadership of your research in order to comply with the code. Um, we do have a guide that supports the code, which has a lot more detail about kind of the implementation of the principles. And um, we will be producing more and more resources. Um, certainly, we will be producing resources around data use um, and data management. Um, uh, to support your work. Um, a lot of the, you know, the feedback we get is that you know, people are really keen to apply the code, but would very much like to understand more about the how. Um, so we're keen to also explore any examples that you have where you've had um, successes in relation to Indigenous data. We'll be looking for, certainly looking for case studies and um, examples that we can point to of good um, practice in relation to Indigenous data ma uh, management. Um, it's also important to acknowledge that we're going to we can talk a little bit later about the difference between applying the code and actually you know the the principle that all research must be ethical, but not all research requires ethical clearance, and that's sometimes a really challenging boundary in relation to data, um, particularly um, heavy um, data based research that's not necessarily, as I said, engaging with particular individuals and communities. Um, so looking at archival or data reuse projects, it can be a really um, blurry line when you're not actually engaging with communities directly or with individuals directly. Um, so we can talk a little bit more about that and I suspect that might be a source of some of the questions and discussions as we move through. And we do have our, our own ethics committee, which is a specialist ethics committee, um, a specialist Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander research ethics committee. Um, and if you do need advice um, specifically about Indigenous research data, um, Indigenous data projects, um, you're more than welcome to put your um, applications and projects to our committee. And Lauren um, uh, is always at the end of the email or the phone to give you some assistance and guidance in how to navigate your particular projects through that process. So what is the print, what is the sort of framework for the IATSIS ethics um, uh, code? So we really focused around four main principles. Um, at the heart of those four principles is the, the notion of integrity, which sits at the basically at the heart of all ethics um, really. And that and that goes to you know the, the why and and who should apply the code. Um, in terms of compliance, um, we do rely on the integrity of researchers and the integrity of institutions to actually guide our, um, our ethics framework in Australia. And that's no different uh, for the IATSIS code. The trick then is to look at how, in particular, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander research projects um, look different or may look different 
to research that you're familiar with. And the principles that apply in relation to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander research are the concept of Indigenous self-determination, first and foremost, the concept of Indigenous leadership of research, uh, impact and value of research, and the sustainability and accountability of research. Those principles in the code are further elaborated in relation to responsibilities for each of those. Um, and we we'll, won't go too far into that given the time, but I will give a brief introduction to the four principles. So we might go to principle one. So principle one is the concept of Indigenous self-determination and is underpinned by the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People um, and the rights that accompany that, um, uh, the right to self-determination, um, in particular control over um, heritage um, and the right to develop um, in, uh, in ways uh, that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people see as important for themselves. Those principles of the right to be involved in research that affects Indigenous people um, and also the recognition of the collective nature of Indigenous societies and that um, often, particularly in relation to data, um, that, that, that there, are, uh, there are collective rights and interests in relation to data that needs to be taken to, into account in relation to uh, the research projects. What we're looking for really in terms of this, uh, the principle of self-determination is that um, there is an understanding that the that Indigenous people will bring a different perspective potentially to the research um, uh, based on the their understanding of the impact that it may have on them or um, how uh, they would like to be involved in the research. Um, and therefore, uh, we really want to see in, uh, in projects that there's an explicit acknowledgement of, um, of how Indigenous people will be involved and meaningfully involved and engaged in the project. When we're describing how, what that looks like in practice in terms of um, how your applications of the projects are designed, we're looking for uh, genuine engagement, meaningful engagement, which includes th that Indigenous people have um, gen you know, genuine decision making um, and involvement from both the design of the project right through to the analysis of the data. Um, the, and the communication of the research and the long-term um, storage uh, and management of the data coming out of the research. In order to demonstrate integrity, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander research needs to demonstrate Indigenous leadership. That doesn't mean that necessarily that there'll be an Indigenous CI on every project. We know that that's not um, necessarily possible. Um, we're not trying to sort of overburden um, the uh, extraordinary Indigenous Academy that we have. There are many ways in which Indigenous people can um, provide leadership to your research, uh, whether that's through um, providing uh, oversight of a program of research, which is often um, useful to think about in the context of um, large uh, um, data sets and, data and um, ongoing uh, data projects or data gathering um, and analysis. Um, so the governance of research um, can reflect, um, be reflective of Indigenous leadership, of course involvement in the research team or through gen you know, genuine partnerships um, with uh, organisations or groups uh, where they, as I said, have um, genuine decision making responsibility in relation to the research. It's also important that research is informed by Indigenous priorities, values, perspectives and voices. Um, and some people might say that that's less relevant for data, but as we, you know, we will, we will sheet home again and again, um, data is not neutral and data in terms of how it was collected, how it's analysed, we bring perspectives, um, our own perspectives and biases to the interpretation of data and all of those need to be checked. Um, as non-Indigenous researchers, um, non-Indigenous researcher myself, um, making sure that we understand that um, uh, data is not just data. There's a cultural context um, to all data, um, the way it's collected, as I said, the way we interpret and, and perceive and communicate the results of that data. In terms of impact and value, the principle of impact and value, uh, the underlying principle is that research uh, with and about Indigenous peoples must aim to benefit Indigenous people. 
Uh, we can't necessarily always in, um, guarantee the outcomes of our research, but that we should have a genuine understanding um, that uh, we are, you know, seeking to not only to avoid harm, but to actually um, address um, the disparities in the impacts of research of the past and to actually bring benefit from the research. When we're talking about benefits, it's really important that we understand that the benefits and risks of research may be interpreted differently um, from an Indigenous perspective than a non-Indigenous perspective, and that needs to be at the forefront of considerations around risks um, and benefit. And the guide, uh, the code and the guide both provide additional guidance on how to um, achieve mutual understanding of benefits and risks. Um, and how to provide evidence that you have actually um, achieved those, um, uh, those considerations. One example when we're thinking about the use of data and the, the kind of biases that we might bring, um, we really, um, a simple example is ensuring that um, we understand the diversity um, uh, of Indigenous peoples um, in Australia and that we consider the different um, impacts um, and risks um, that we may have, that the research may have, particularly, for example, going to generalisations and extrapolations of findings that mask diversity that could actually do uh, unintended harm. So again, having Indigenous perspectives um, and um, uh, brought to bear on analysis um, of data is a really important way of checking um, that we actually have that understanding of um, the diverse impacts that we, we may have from our research and how to kind of mitigate those risks of both biases and generalizations and um, masking diversity. In terms of sustainability and accountability, the final principle, we're looking at particularly around data, the sustainability principle uh, is really goes to ensuring that the knowledge and data collected during research projects are available for use by current and future generations. So um, this goes to uh, things like your data management plans about repatriation of data to Indigenous peoples and nations, um, uh, ensuring that Indigenous people have uh, access to data that is of importance to them um, and particularly important for their decision making at the local level or the national level. Um, so all of that gets incorporated into the code and the guide to the code. Um, so to give you some ideas about how to, uh, where managing data for the sustainability for Indigenous communities may differ from the way you might manage data um, more generally. So the question then is, as I said earlier, there's a difference between understanding when the code applies and when ethical review is required. Um, in terms of when ethical review is required, we are, uh, we do follow the national statement and the national statement on ethical conduct and research basically says that research with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples must be reviewed and approved by Human Research Ethics Committee. That's currently under review and might change, but it does kind of invite the precautionary principle with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander research or research that may impact Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that um, uh, in general, you can expect that there's no, there's not really a differentiation between low risk and high risk um, so the, the risk assessment that you might do in relation to other research doesn't necessarily at the moment apply to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander research. So research with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people includes research with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's data. Um, and, in, and it's a kind of a rule of thumb at the moment that that must be reviewed and approved by Human Research Ethics Committee. When you are looking at which Human Research Ethics Committee, you should be looking at a qualified, um, what term qualified, Human Research Ethics Committee, and that is one that has experience um, with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander research um, and has members that are able to uh, speak to um, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander perspective in relation to the research. I'll bring back to the fact that IATSIS has a specialist committee um, if any of you ever need um, that kind of oversight for your research. So that takes us to 12.30. So I promised I would only speak for 20 minutes. So <laughs> um, please don't hesitate to reach out. I'm looking forward to the conversation. I'm sure there's lots of questions you have already banked up. 
Um, so we will uh, uh, let the floodgates open and um, invite conversation. Fantastic. Thank you, Lisa. Um, and yeah, if you could, uh, if you've got any questions, just um, pop them in the chat. Um, I suppose I'm going to start with one. Um, I'm quite curious about your perspective about the relationship between um, so sustainability and um, making data available for use for current and future generations versus uh, how we might typically think about um, data access and data sharing. Um, and I suppose particularly because I think there can often be a perspective that that uh, data sharing and uh, that is, is something that's uh, antithetical to um, how we might um, look at Indigenous data management. And um, but it's I think it's interesting to look at, think about that perspective of keeping data and making data available for future benefit, um, but how that might be, how it's the same and how it's different to how we might uh, otherwise approach uh, data sharing. Sure. Um, yeah, so, you know, the general um, push across the research sector has been uh, that more, more sharing is better, uh, easier access to data is better, uh, and all of you will be familiar with the FAIR principles, findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable, you know, the idea that researchers should have ready access to as much data, you know, to data when and if they need it, that it should be, you know, findable. Um, and the, I guess the Indigenous perspective that we have tried to reflect in the code is that that that, that is not okay, both on... Um, on the principle of the the kind of history of um, access and control of information about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in Australia and in other um, similarly colonised countries, um, but also on the principles of um, self determination uh, that are that inherently lend themselves to Indigenous people being able to make decisions about what data is collected and available about them. So for those of you who are interested, um, I mentioned before about the Global Indigenous Data Alliance, which um, uh, short is GIDA. So there's a, a website called gida-global.org. Um, and there you can find kind of the answer to the FAIR principles, which um, I refer to as the CARE principles. And that is really that, you know, Indigenous data needs to be um, held and maintained and managed for the collective benefit of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people or Indigenous people globally, that Indigenous people need to have the authority to control how their data is used and interpreted, um, and that they should have responsibility for, um, for how that um, data is managed, um, and that the da and data is collected and managed in an, uh, in an ethical way, so in accordance with um, the IATSIS code, for example. And in Australia, it's very easy to point to the why for that um, in terms of, uh, for those of you who, um, I mean, all of you should be aware of uh, concepts like um, uh, deficit um, discourse. Um, so deficit discourse uh, is a general um, description, I guess, of the ways in which Indigenous people have been represented, whether it's in media or research, um, in relation to disadvantage without actual recognition of Indigenous people's strengths um, and um, uh, the holding Indigenous people's values, worldviews and perspectives in as high, in, in great equal esteem um, to any other system of, of knowledge. Um, and those concepts of deficit and, and there's some great work by, for those of you who haven't seen it, by Maggie Walter, who's a Palawa Indigenous academic, Australian academic, um, uh, who's got some great, um, e e quite easily available, uh, I think on the web, I think on the ARDC's website even, um, uh, there's a, a seminar that I can recommend to all of you about the, the kind of the, the risks and um, uh, the, the history that um, Indigenous data uh, principles, data sovereignty principles seek to address. So I'd recommend Maggie's work to all of you. 
Thanks, Lisa. And um, I think uh, Leslie had a, an interesting um, uh, sort of addendum to that, which is um, she points out that the A in FAIR is for access. So it's about knowing what the conditions are to access data. And she points out that FAIR is not equal to open. And I think that the, um, the care principles and um, more generally the code, I think, inform some of those access conditions that then um, are reflected in the A of FAIR. So uh, they aren't necessarily two sets of principles that are in opposition, but rather um, principles that um, sort of inform one another. Yeah. Thanks, Leslie, and thanks, Nicola. Yes, that's very much the case. Um, I wouldn't go so far as to say the A in FAIR is enough, um, uh, hence the introduction of the care principles, but that's exactly right. So even the FAIR principles were never intended to be, you know, open slather, um, and that appropriate access um, is um, part of understanding that principle of accessible. Um, so uh, we've had so a question, question oh. about breach. Yes. 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 Yeah. Um, so that brings me back to the central point of our ethical framework, which is integrity. So in Australia, we actually have a really strong um, uh, ethics system because we have a fairly centralised research funding system. Um, and uh, the, the collaboration between the NHMRC, the Australian Research Council and Universities Australia in um, publishing the, both the Code for Responsible Conduct and Research and the National Statement um, provides a really strong foundation for ethics in Australia. Um, and the code fits into that framework. So um, in terms of, uh, responsibilities and compliance with the code. The code, the IATSIS code is a requirement of any um, funding provided by NHMRC and ARC, um, as well as IATSIS um, and also um, uh, any research that's conducted through the National Indigenous Australians Agency or funded by them. Um, so the compliance really comes from um, the requirement that people comply with the code on the way in, so in the funding sense, um, and then the, the principles of ethical review. So it's consistent really with other, other the other ethics framework documents. Um, uh, in terms of responsible conduct of research, um, that there are specific um, remedies and, and processes within universities and any research institution that is bound by the code of conduct in relation to breaches of the code itself, code of conduct itself. Um, so that's, yeah, that's uh, really where we fit into the systems that you already have in place within your universities in terms of um, uh, your responsibilities to your ethics committees um, that give you clearance and your responsibilities under the relevant um, policies in relation to responsible conduct. Thanks. Um... So we've had a request, uh, someone has just said, I'm very keen to see use cases and best pr practice examples for research data management plans. Um, do you have any examples um, that you can share or anything that you can point us to? Um, I'm gonna ask I, Lauren, we, we, have, we have examples. Um, we are developing a resource specifically to showcase some of those examples and draw out the lessons learned. Um, if anyone does need um, some tips, uh, we also have, you know, kind of a, a, I guess, a log of advice from our ethics committee around data management plans. Um, there is some fairly detailed material in the guide as well in relation to data management plans, um, and also some of the background issues around um, intellectual property um, and in Indigenous cultural intellectual property um, that can help in managing, you know, developing those data plans. Um, and there's also some a, a, a bit of in, um, information around around data governance. So looking at ways in which you might establish um, uh, data governance committees or um, uh, those kind of uh, overarching governance to guide when you, especially when you've got big sets of data, um, to be able to help you guide um, access to that. Um, there's some really good examples out there. They're, some some are new. Um, and emerging, and there's some really uh, great examples um, 
one that I'm part of, which is the, the My Kauai study um, of the cultural determinants of wellbeing. Um, and there's some information on that website about how they have gone about their Indigenous um, data governance. Um, it's a great example. Um, and we'll also be having a session at the IATSA Summit if any of you are going to be making your way to Adelaide in um, at the end of May, start of June. Um, we'll be having a bit of a focus on putting the principles into practice. Um, thanks, Lisa. Um, I might uh, chase up with you afterwards for some um, some of those links and put them into our community document so that um, everyone can access them. Um, I have an interesting question here. Uh, research that impacts Indigenous peoples could be interpreted extremely broadly. How is this interpreted in order to be effective? Yeah, yeah, it is. It, it can be, you know, anything. Um, so the the way that we um, address it in the code is to look at, um, so there is a definition um, of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander research in the code that you can refer to. Um, I'm just trying to bring it up in detail so that I don't lead you astray. Um, have you got it there? So particularly when you're looking at um, data that may incidentally um, involve Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, that doesn't necessarily mean that our code is um, uh, is invoked at that stage. But for example, if um, if your if the data reveals something particular um, that's particularly unique to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cohort, and you wish to do particular research, further research on that um, part of the data, then we would be looking for you to get ethical clearance and to apply the principles of the code to that. So, um, so it's not meant to be, you know, apply the code to absolutely all research in Australia. I think it is incumbent on us as researchers um, in Australia to to think about um, whether there is an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander perspective or unique attribute that could bring value to our projects. Um, you know, whether we should actually design our projects differently. Um, uh, but the definition um, that Lauren's just brought up there in terms of the code gives you a bit more specific. Um, guidance as to when you are actually looking at Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander research. Thank you. Um, I don't think people need to make, to go through it, do they? Just that you know it's there. Yes, I think that's. Um, how has the code been shared with government departments who rely heavily on Indigenous communities for research activities? Yeah, so we worked we worked very closely with Commonwealth agencies in particular at this stage. Um, we will be um, making training available to to state and territory governments in the normal course of things. Um, we've actually been doing some really interesting work with the National Indigenous Australians Agency over the last two years under a um, under a partnership agreement um, to train um, their staff both as researchers themselves, so using data about Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, but also as commissioners of research. So in the way that they structure their evaluations um, and their engagement, particularly with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander organisations and communities. Um, so uh, there's a lot of work still to do in relation to that. There's also been some really important work done by the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, Productivity Commissioner um, Romley Mokak, who did a review um, or did a report and a, a kind of a, a proposal for a Commonwealth Indigenous evaluation strategy, which um, has ethics as one of its core principles or core uh, pillars, um, and is again consistent, you know, in terms of the principles of the code to be applied in evaluation. Um, so there's kind of those two things around. Um, uh, general kind of accessing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander data and making decisions around policy and programs and that are heavily reliant on data reuse. So educating governments about the fact that that is research and requires an ethical approach. Um, and then there's the kind of commissioning of research. Um, and the, the principles of the code can also be applied in relation to policy design. So because the principles are based around Indigenous partnership, you know, about genuine partnerships um, and uh, engaging Indigenous people as decision makers in research, the principles are actually equally applicable to, you know, 
contemporary um, debates around uh, um, what good policy looks like in terms of co-design and um, uh, delegating or devolving decision making to the local communities um, who are best placed to understand what's going to work in their own communities. And um, I think that ties really interestingly onto um, another well of sort of observation and question that we have here. Um, so this person says, uh, I am a researcher by background, but now work mainly with nonprofits to help them monitor, evaluate, evaluate and learn from their programs. Seeking formal ethical approval is often not feasible in the scope, time and intention of the evaluation. Any advice? I've been working recently evaluating a service that's from a youth service that's not Aboriginal led, but 60% of their clients are Aboriginal. In that case, we did get formal ethical approval, but it took a very long time and, co and thus cost. And unfortunately, it didn't add much value. I'd argue that wasn't necessarily ethical either. Yeah, so the, the evaluation sector is is interesting in the fact that, um, you know, we've been very clear that um, evaluation often involves research um, and therefore um, the code should apply. Um, and one of the things we have been working with NIAA about um, to kind of improve that evaluation practice is that they need to take account of ethics in the way they fund evaluations, the time they provide, but also the way that they actually assess um, you know, requests for tender. So looking at the cultural competency of the evaluation team um, and, uh, and actually asking them to address ethics in the way they structure their RFQs. So that's front end loading it and for the, for the commissioners of the evaluations to actually understand the value of ethics and ethical clearance has been a really important um, piece of work with with that Commonwealth agency that of course doesn't help those of you who are working with others so um, I think we are seeing an improvement in the quality of the applications that we're getting to our REC from particularly um, a, you know, consultancy companies that are not used to necessarily putting in ethics applications so for some, sometimes it's it's really a challenge for people who have never been through the ethics process to to get through in a timely manner because they often get you know asked to come back um, and to to resubmit or you know to make changes um, and that can take that can take a significant amount of time. So instead of getting it through in a couple of months, you're actually you know waiting six months down the track. Um, so we can provide some support, I guess, in terms of. For our ethics committee, we our secretariat provides support to make sure that the applications themselves are in the have the best chance of actually getting through on their first go. Um, uh, there are some um, again, we will be providing some guidance specifically for evaluation clients. I think for for those of you who are um, involved in doing evaluations where it's you know it's just not feasible to get through in the time that's available. Um, I think it's important just to, to remember that you can still apply the principles and, and ensure that your research is ethical, um, regardless of whether clearance is actually required or can be done. Thank you, Lisa. Um... How much evidence of Indigenous involvement and leadership is required? Often Indigenous investigators at my university feel this is an obstacle for them because we request a formal and detailed research agreement. Um, so where was that? Sorry. I don't think that, hang on, here we go. Oh, here we go. Um, yeah, so uh, it is, often challenging in relation to um, for Indigenous investigators to um, um, be asked to kind of uh, to, to demonstrate their own leadership and their own cultural capability and I, we understand that but there are still um, other aspects of the the code that will benefit all um, researchers Indigenous and non-Indigenous in relation to guidance around data management or ICIP um, so those kind of things um, there is a the requirement for a formal and detailed research agreement, uh, the reason that we recommend a research agreement be put in place is because particularly around ICIP, so Indigenous cultural intellectual property um, is not well protected by Australian law, so that often the laws around intellectual property are actually um, 
uh, can actually uh, dispossess Indigenous people of their cultural property. Um, and so if we do want, if a if, if community wants to retain copyright, for example, over um, the data or you know, ownership of the data, then sometimes that actually requires a legal um, form in order for that to happen. Um, there are other ways um, other than a formal agreement that you can actually um, address some of the issues in relation to the, the, um, the principles of leadership. And that can go to uh, how Indigenous people are involved as authors, researchers, um, collaborators, um, and communicators of the research. So um, by, and, and the, the um, ARC, NHMRC and Universities Australia guides that support the code of conduct are quite useful here when they talk about, um, in terms of authorship, for example, uh, an author can be someone who makes a significant intellectual contribution to the work. Um, it doesn't necessarily require somebody to hold a pen. So that's an important principle to understand in terms of where the intellectual contributions are coming from and how you might recognise those. So, but again, it's really important to ensure that that understanding of uh, ownership, um, distribution of benefit, uh, recognition of um, the contributions, uh, that that is a shared understanding right from the start. So if there is no formal agreement in place, it, there must be other ways in which you can evidence that you have informed consent from the individuals and the communities involved in your research. Thank you. Um, Okay, any tips on starting conversations around this with a centre of Aboriginal research without reverting to a paternalistic approach? Yeah, it's, we do put a lot of, um, when, um, when as non-Indigenous people engaging research, um, being cognizant of um, placing burdens on our Indigenous colleagues to educate us. Um, and um, that can be, um, frustrating for them and, and, and difficult for us. I think uh, um, understanding your own cultural capability and competency um, and whether you are best placed to do this research is a really good start in terms of your own critical thinking and going in with under, that understanding of that you may be carrying your own biases is an important way of actually bridging that gap and coming coming to those conversations authentically and, and generously um, on your part. So. Being understanding of what, you know, understanding that there's stuff you just don't know um, and uh, being able to seek advice um, about how to best structure your research. Um, uh, that's really, you know, my best advice is to go um, uh, with that sort of authentic um, and genuine understanding of your own limitations and, and where you think you can contribute and where you think you need assistance. There was also a follow up to the evaluation question of how, um, and this is quite a common thing, um, that there was a, a comment there that the application itself or the project itself was sound, but the committee may actually be the problem. And I think this is one of the challenges that we all have, that we have across the research sector is ensuring that committees are actually competent to apply the principles of the code um, and to understand the, the nuances, particularly around data projects. Um, uh, we will be making training available to HREX, um, and, um, but as I said, if you're in doubt, then please don't hesitate to access the IATSIS Research Ethics Committee um, who have um, more experience, I guess, in terms of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander research. Um, we are getting an increased demand on our ethics committee, so we are meeting more regularly. So if you've ever tried to access our committee um, before, um, our oh, poor Judy, <laughs> and it was an Aboriginal hate trick. So I, I feel for you um, in terms of some of the challenges that we have in terms of getting through ethics clearance. Um, uh, so by all means, use us if, if we can be of help uh, in the future. Brilliant. Um, okay, I have one here asking about um, when ethical approval might be required. And um, they say, okay, a research study on an issue that includes ancillary Aboriginal people's data, e.g. a study of re respiratory diseases in New South Wales, geographical areas for all of the population, but adjusting for age, gender, socioeconomic index, and uh, percentage of Aboriginal population. So data that's coming from the ABS. Uh, so if you're adjusting for 
um, percentage of the Aboriginal population is at a point where um, you need to consider this to be uh, sort of Indigenous research or um, I, I, I'm not expecting you necessarily to, to tell us exactly where that line falls, yeah. <laughs> but I yeah. think it's an, it's an interesting question. Yeah. Um, and we have had this discussion. We had this discussion um, with uh, our advisory group in relation to framing the, the code itself. And that's why we sort of try to be explicit about where the target population is not explicitly Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, but includes a significant number or the outcomes may be significantly different. Um, that, that that's not necessarily going to be Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander research. But if you want to start commenting on what that means for Aboriginal people, um, or you want to pull out that data and, and, and interrogate it more closely, that's when we would recommend that you get ensure that you have Indigenous perspectives and leadership in relation to the analysis of that data um, so that you don't uh, ask the wrong questions of the data or make the wrong, you know, make the wrong decision, um, judgments about what the data is telling you. Thanks. Um, so in your experience, does the responsibilities of nav navigating the IATSIS code fall on central research or ethics departments or on uh, research data management or research support areas? I would say all of the above. So in terms of applying, you know, as researchers, we have a responsibility to understand our obligations under the code and under the the other two key documents in relation to responsible and ethical conduct and research in Australia. Um, institutions have responsibilities um, and commissioners of research have responsibilities. Um, uh, so at, at each of those points, we try to articulate in the code where those responsibilities lie. So under the responsibilities under each principle, we have directed to where we think this, you know, what we think the responsibilities HREC specifically might be what we think the responsibility of institutions might be and where we think um, the responsibility of the researcher lies. So we've tried to be, um, articulate that quite clearly about what this principle means for each of those particular groups. Brilliant. And um, someone's just asked, uh, is there any advice on the point at which a project should come to HREC during the engagement stage? Um, the HREC may need help in the staged review process. Yes, that's, yeah, that's a challenge too in terms of to how, how much work do you do before you go for ethics clearance? Um, our ethics committee's guidance tends to be um, that uh, think you know we we want engagement to start at the design stage, um, and uh, it may be that um, you want to seek ethics approval specifically for that design phase. Why you might do that is if you want to, um, for example, publish the design. Um, publish about the design phase or to use data that you collect, so interviews that you might conduct in that design phase if you want to use them in later in the research. So if you think that you're developing something that's particularly innovative in terms of method methodology and in terms of the co-design process and you might want to publish that, then we would suggest that you get ethical approval beforehand. The reason we you might do that is because, um, again, those questions about who's actually providing the intellectual input to that design is it actually you know we don't want to end up in a situation where researchers are publishing about and claiming ownership of a process that indigenous people you know re reflects indigenous people's values and worldviews and ways of working um, and then that suddenly becomes um, uh, uh, published and proprietary um, so those are the kind of risks that we would be looking for in that design phase that you've addressed those um, intellectual contributions um, and the contributions from the participants in the research. Um, so, so you can get um, uh, ethical approval for a design phase and it means that you won't have necessarily the aims of the project um, articulated in detail or the survey questions. So you would come back to the ethics committee for a second stage once you've actually um, gone through that um, with your research partners um, and develop those things. So that's that's certainly an option. So really, it, you know, yeah, it, it's kind of a, I wouldn't say it's a rule, but kind of a rule of thumb. If you are going to publish the results of your design phase, then you, the precautionary approach would be to get ethics review for that phase. 
Thanks. And um, we are just about to come up to time, but um, I think that was a, an interesting segue into uh, for situations where the institution will have IP and be attributed as the primary author. Are there any examples for providing attribution to communities? And maybe that's something um, if we're after examples and you have some that uh, we can share those after yeah. the meeting. I actually saw a wonderful example last week where one of the co-authors was the river that was the subject of the research. So things are changing in terms of people's expectations, but also what we perceive as possible and appropriate in terms of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander research. So um, keep your ears and eyes peeled um, for really innovative and um, uh, changing ways of um, improving our practice. Brilliant, and I think that's a, a lovely place for us to end. Um, thank you everyone so much for your um, participation, your questions. Thank you again, um, Lisa, for a really fantastic talk. And um, I will see you all hopefully at the next meeting. And um, yes, I'll be sharing uh, the recordings um, so uh, you can share this with your colleagues. Thank you all Excellent. very much. Thank you. Thanks everybody. And sorry if we missed your question, but um, we'll see if we can follow up um, by email as well.